Okay, good morning, listeners. Social entrepreneurs can help communities and make money at the same time. What a concept. You don't have to be a greedy corporation. You could give back. A technical definition is a social entrepreneur is an individual who is willing to take risks and pursue profits by creating positive changes in society through their services or products. My guest today, Dr. Guadalupe Butron, fits that definition to a T. The small business world needs more people like her. Before I ask Lupe to, before I ask her a few questions, I would like to share just a brief summary of her bio. It's very inspirational. Lupe's parents immigrated to the U.S. from Mexico, and Lupe was born here. Initially, Lupe was a bilingual mental therapist. We'll ask her more about that. Later, she earned her master's and doctorate degree from California Baptist University, where she majored in social work. Not satisfied with that, she wanted to do more to help the poor, marginalized individuals and their communities. She started her own business. She became an entrepreneur. Now, that's kind of weird. I don't normally see professors and entrepreneurs in the same breath, but that's what she did. So she formed the Financially Capable, which mission statement is financial literacy and wellness, and she formed a limited liability company. She's been doing all of that in the last two years. And as you could see on YouTube, or hear her voice, she's only 30 years old. Oh my God. So let's bring her out. Lupe, what what drives you? You know what? That's a fantastic question because I get asked that all the time. Um, And I think this is a point, uh, 29, I turned 30 this year, so. Oh, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's really old, 30, okay. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know what? I just have always been that type of person who just is always going and going and has ideas and likes projects and likes just uh, doing good stuff in the world um, and things that help people and communities. Um, it's I'm lucky that I really love the the field of social work. I find it interesting. So um, it's just been uh, part just how I'm wired. And uh, I just find these topics really important. And my past and like my experiences have just all inspired me to just con- do the work that I do, basically. Were you like this as a kid, too? I want to say yes. I've always been the overachiever type. Um, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> I like okay. school. It just kind of uh, worked for me, basically. Did you have brothers and sisters, Lupe? I have one sister. Okay. Were you competing against her as to who gets the best grades or? Uh, not my sister. I would say more the people around me, like my people my own age. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's, you know, because what we are today, a lot of it is our family dynamics, uh, our brothers and sisters, our parents. So in 25 words or less, what is the mission statement of your new young company, the Financially Capable? Uh, The Financially Capable, our mission is to help uh, individuals, first generation, uh, individuals of color, uh, communities of color to increase their financial wellness or improve their financial wellness um, and be able to um, move up in their uh, social mobility, uh, help increase generational wealth and just learn how to have a, a healthier relationship with money. Are these, um, is this personal finance or business finance or both? Both. 
I've worked with both. Um, I started it with the idea of doing personal finance, but I've just opportunities. I've uh, and have ended up working with a lot of entrepreneurs this uh, past year. Okay. Okay. So I understand you graduated from the Caravanserai project. What did you learn from CP on how to start a new business from scratch? Because that's not easy to do. Right. Right. And I I'm, I don't know anyone else who has started a business in like my own personal community. So it was definitely a step into the unknown and the uncomfortable. So I'm so thankful for Caravan Sarai Project. Uh, the executive director, Mihai, and his team have been like absolute wonderful. Um, the program really helped me just learn the basic um, like fundamentals of like business um like how to file all of the uh, the paperwork the legal paperwork how to you know set up your uh, business finances um and i think the most important part that i always um uh, tell people when i'm sharing about that experience is just being surrounded by other entrepreneurs who are um you know doing good work uh maybe not similar to what i'm doing but are still you know impacting their communities cuz they uh, definitely specialize in helping entrepreneurs of color and in those who have like a social impact type of business uh so i think that has been the best uh uh opportunity just to meet other like-minded individuals well but would you agree now that you went through this and you ultimately started your business that mm -hmm. that any listener whether they're female young no matter what their ethnicity before you plunge in to start a business you need to learn some of the basics and the fundamentals because it's critical would you not oh, agree with that definitely um i think that doing your research that way you like uh decrease the risk right of uh maybe doing uh mistakes that could have easily been avoided if you would have you know taken the time to just learn um like exactly what the steps look like for filing and you know licenses and uh, insurance um so i think that was just really helpful to kind of get all those fundamentals so that i was able to move forward in the best way possible for my business okay because i um i'm a big proponent of of education and I have mm. a number of clients that just, they just plunge in. It's almost like they're rolling the dice. They mm. they fall in love with their idea, but they're not really prepared for the, for the battle that's out there because mm. there's so much option. So, okay, yeah. well, that's, that's really good. Um, um, I'm, I know Mihai and his group and they do a wonderful job. So it's glad to see that they have a, a full-time graduate that went through the roots and now is on their own business. And whether my listeners pursue some kind of student atmosphere, it doesn't really matter. They can get the information on the internet. There's no shortage of information on, on okay. how they can learn the basics. So, so how do you organize your time? Now you're still a full-time business professor, right? Yes, so I'm a full time social work professor, and then I do and my you're running your business. Mm -hmm. Do you sleep? Uh, yes, I try very hard to get enough sleep so that I'm able to you know perform the best. But it's definitely a lot to juggle. Definitely something to consider is um, it can be a lot of work in the beginning to set everything up and to get your you know the right. ball rolling. Right. Uh, it's a lot of work for sure. But you're managing it so far. I am. I'm thankful that I have a job that is uh, that I love and that it's also flexible. So I'm able to make it work. OK, so there you go. You it is possible to be a business professor and an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur at the same time, mm -hmm. provided that you're a little organized and you don't fall in love with too much sleep. Though, right. 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 Definitely. So. You know, I used to teach, so I'm going to ask you this question. So when you're a business professor, you have your students that are that are taking your courses and you're going to try and teach them mm -hmm. certain issues. And then you have your for profit business where you have clients mm -hmm. and you're going to teach and mentor them as well. Are there common mm -hmm. denominators between those two audiences or are they completely separate? 
I think that, so I teach social work. So social work students tend to be very diverse, come from very different types of communities that sometimes mirror the type of clients that I work with. So I would say that's a simil similarity. Um, and I would also think that since I've been working with entrepreneurs mostly lately, um, and at least in the last year, um, the only difference is that these the students are looking to go into the field and get a like normal nine to five job. And on, these entrepreneurs I'm working are trying to uh, work through maybe some uh, mental blocks, you know, some mental barriers to help them uh, get into that mindset of like, you know, moving forward, success, uh, you know, getting those goals set and, and uh, working towards them. I see. OK, so, you know, in a, in a real sort of simple caveman language well the students that's my job and my clients that's how i get paid so mm -hmm. students get it for free sort of basically yeah um, um okay so the your class your your students primarily are, are going to enter into the workforce uh, mm -hmm. for a nine to five job your business clients you're trying to teach them financial literacy and financial wellness in order to allow them to uh, expand their businesses. Do I add that correct? Right. Right. Do you, yes. So do you believe there's any competitors are doing what you're doing as far as uh, your business? I think that I bring a very interesting perspective because my background is not business or finance. It's social work and psychology. And I, you know, I worked as a mental health therapist and I have found that through my experience doing more traditional social work, mental health type of stuff is that um, money tends to be a, a factor in a lot of uh, when people are having issues. Um, sometimes uh, when they're having financial issues, a lot of it could also just be about their like where they're at men and mentally, either mental capacity, some of the thoughts or um, uh, beliefs that they have. So I found that talking about money in this different way really helps people kind of like work through the more mental emotional psychological things that sometimes keep people from reaching their financial goals so I think that because it's such an like a more it's different you know you you have a lot of financial literacy programs out there there's so, so much um you know a uh, push which is wonderful for more financial knowledge but I think what I bring is just a different um I approach the conversation differently. So I think that that's what sets me and my business apart. Okay. Um, is there, is it a fair question to ask you, Lupe? Is there sort of like a, a profile of who your target market is in terms of age, education, mm -hmm. experience, uh, ethnicity, mm -hmm. location, type of industry? So... I have always wanted to focus on young adults. So like post-college, um, I am a first generation college student, college graduate. So I really have a, uh, just a soft spot for first generation uh, college graduates getting into the workforce and kind of, you know, ex uh, getting exposed to a different um, environment or atmosphere than maybe what they were used to growing up. So that's definitely a, a, pocket, a community that I'm really, really wanting to work with. And I have. And then I have really enjoyed working with Spanish speaking entrepreneurs. I think that um, there's some there's there's a bit of limitation in the resources that they can access. So I think that um, me being bilingual and able to have these conversations with them is um, um, really important and really needed. So I really enjoyed working with uh, limited uh, English speaking, so mostly Spanish speaking entrepreneurs as well. Okay, well, I can. That's that's definitely a a niche, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. So your Spanish speaking clients are they bilingual? Um, some they some of them are. I found that some of them are just very like their English uh speaking abilities are very limited. So it's mostly on in Spanish, and then there's some that are more bilingual. Um, and we can kind of flip flop between both languages. But they're young, they have energy, they want to learn, they want to start their own business, they're not interested in a job. Mm -hmm. And the whole area of money uh, can sometimes be intimidating because, um, you know, I have another company that, 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 that deals with that. And um, 
not necessarily everybody manages their money or is has the expertise to know how to acquire it, to budget it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how big do you think that market is that you're trying to tap in Southern California? I, from what I've researched and I have looked, so there's other financial therapists out there, but I feel like I have not seen a lot. I haven't seen many who are doing this type of work in Spanish. So I think that I have a very big um, opportunity to really uh, uh, target this community because there isn't really anyone that I see other than myself and maybe one or two other people doing this work. Okay. Well, I noticed you use the term financial therapist. Mm -hmm. So that's different than a, let's just say, a traditional chief financial officer, CFO. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can understand from your perspective and meeting other people that the, 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 the mental and the, and the therapeutic aspect of money is really critical. People mm -hmm. don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. like, a lot of times they just get depressed because they don't have enough money to expand the business, nor do they know how, and they get frozen. So what is your advice to small business CEOs, regardless of their mm -hmm. ethnicity, to become better leaders? Because mm -hmm. I know that's one of the, the, the subject matters that you teach. How do they become better um, leaders? I think that a lot of self-work is very important. Um, I think if you understand yourself better and how you think and what are your values and beliefs, I think that helps you be more intentional about what you're wanting to accomplish with um, in terms of your leadership. So um, I think self-reflection, self-work is super important so that you can be your best possible self so mm -hmm. that as a leader, you're able to uh, make that impact that you're wanting to make. Or get and, to the outcome that you're wanting to make. And is that is that related to age, or that could just be young people, middle age, or older people? Or is your message I to think young anybody. people? Okay. I think everybody. I think that. Um, I and then it might be just because of my social work, mental health background. But I'm like, I think that truly doing that inner work and knowing yourself and understanding yourself and how you look at the world, process things, is just going to make you a better leader because you're going to be more self aware. Um, and you're going to be able to have more capacity to deal with the things that life throws you, your business throws at you. Um, and I think that that's really important. And that emotional okay. intelligence. So since you, in the beginning of the show, you classified yourself as uh, always being busy, uh, always working on something. Do you have some future plans for the company in terms of services or products that you'd like to get involved in? geographic yeah. areas yeah um, and if you might would mind sharing those with me yeah definitely so I um I've been really thinking about uh developing a program because I am just one person right so I can only ever like work with a certain number of clients because I then reach my capacity in terms of hours in the week right. available right, right? So right. my desire is to hire uh, other social work background individuals. So whether they have their master's in social work or their bachelor's in social work, uh, hire them, train them in this uh, subspecialty and have them also be able to provide this uh, service so that it can I can just expand my reach and be able to make a wider impact in the community that I am. Because I'm just one person. So I'm like, how can I, you know, multiply this, uh, the impact that I can have um, and that's having more people who are able to uh, use this lens or, or approach that I use with other clients. Yes. Well, there's a famous book about that. And um, the author says, you know, you start off as the worker bee. You're doing everything because you can't afford to hire anybody. Right. And then you grow a little bit and you're able to hire a few people. Then you morph into the role as the manager. You direct their efforts and then you continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And then you hire managers and now you're the chief executive officer who's really focused on not getting the work out today, but mm -hmm. being the visionary and thinking and strategic planning on where do I want my company to be in three to five years. But right. you got to, you know, you have to crawl before you walk, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you ever see yourself expanding out of state or do you, you, but to stay in Southern California, assuming you had enough personnel. 
Right. Um, I would love to. I, like I said, I think this is so needed and I see such a huge, uh, like, lack of this type of service or this type of approach or perspective out in the, in our um, country and the different communities. So I would love to. Um, I think that definitely something in the horizon to think about as I continue growing and scaling my business. Okay. So I know my listeners, um, I'm going to, I'm going to pretend that I'm one of the listeners of this podcast show. Okay. So Lupe, give me a concrete example of a client coming to you. Mm -hmm. What question are they throwing at you and saying, Lupe, help me. Every time I raise my arm, it hurts. And then mm -hmm. you say, stop raising your arm. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. What, <laughs> give me an example of, of a real life case where a client had a challenge mm -hmm. and what you did for he or she, what, what, what was the program? Definitely. Um, that's a great question. I think that what I see often is individuals who are um, from the specifically from the community and like the specific clients that I uh, really want to work with. This person is someone who maybe financially in the past haven't hasn't had the best situation, didn't grow up with a lot of money, maybe struggled with unemployment, just you know instability. And now that they're they're in a place in their career where they have a lot, they're they are financially stable, they're making good income, more than they you know had ever thought about in their you know lives. And then now they're just you know have this these certain financial goals, but they find themselves just really still struggling to like mentally accept maybe that they're able to accomplish these goals or they find themselves like still struggling with that like no I need to save all my money I can't ex I can't spend my money on things that I uh, want and want to enjoy because I still have this like fear that I am going to go back to this place of like instability so working through then our focus would be just working through like you know getting out of survival mode, you're now in a place where there's abundance, right? You have income that's coming in that um, is really steady and stable. And you're right. able to let go of maybe these like fear induced strategies of like saving money and making sure you have enough for like a rainy day. But like being finding that like confidence and finding that like, okay, I can now move to this new season of my life and be able to change my mindset about how I view money. Like it's not something that's scary and stressful. Now it's something that you can enjoy and uh, grow and build something even greater. So, so uh, it, it's, it's sort of psychologically based then, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's not, it's not. Um, so if people is, is the message people should not be fearful of money as a subject, but how is it a asset or a tool that can help you accomplish in your life, which is whatever you want to accomplish? Basically, a lot of times when you have people coming from backgrounds of poverty or inst financial instability, you I feel like they associate money and finances with stress and fear. Yes, yes, yes. It can be hard to overcome that if you then get to a place where that's not your story anymore, but you're still kind of acting and making decisions based out of that fear. And you're just going to uh, sabotage yourself. You're not going to allow yourself to be able to grow. <clears throat> Well, that, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir because um, it's very interesting to me in my walk as an entrepreneur. I have a, 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 a private company that I deal with in addition to this podcast. And about 60% of the clients uh, of my target market for my private company are probably between the ages of 35 to 65. Mm. and at least 70% of them are financially illiterate mm. in terms of the whole subject of money. And so what they do is they ignore it. Mm -hmm. yep. They say, well, that's the office manager takes care of that or da 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 And what happens, that is the number one reason why small businesses fail is because the owners 
can't overcome the fear of dealing with money and they think it's going to fix itself and it doesn't mm -hmm. and the companies go bankrupt basically yep so it sounds like me like you're preparing their minds for take it head on baby it, mm -hmm. you can do it yeah. and i'm here to help you you're like a money therapist basically that's why <laughs> i use the term financial therapist is just helping people get out of that un like stuck place of and they, and they get stuck pain. yeah when yeah. they when they get older they get stuck mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah i get it um it's sorely needed so mm -hmm. my uh kudos to you for coming up with the idea thank you and um i'm so impressed by who you are and what you do at such a young age congratulations and whether you realize it or not you're a role model to to not only young people but to um young hispanic women uh, because we're becoming you know the whole area of diversity and inclusion is out there but you still got to go for it right you've gone for it you've made it and i suspect that you're going to continue to do more and more as you get bored and you need to stow, you need to throw more ideas in that brain of yours. So, um, so if you could leave one final statement to to the audience, mm -hmm. what would you what would you want them to learn or know? What would you want to share with them? Just one point to conclude mm -hmm. our show today. Your mind is a powerful thing. And if you're not working on maybe undoing these mental blocks or barriers, um, that it can really hurt your business. So if you really want to like succeed and work forward, really work on your mindset and work on maybe undoing unhealthy patterns, unhealthy uh, beliefs, because those will definitely get in the way of your goals um, and success if you let them. Right. Well put, well put. So, okay. Well, thank you so much, Lupi. That was a that was a great show. Um, so, what I'd like to do now is say goodbye to everyone. Uh, this concludes our show. My shows air twice a month, every other Wednesday. You can access these episodes on my YouTube channel, CDO to Rainmaker, or any of the major podcast directories. If you're into audio, like. Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, or you can access all of my shows, including today's with Lupe, at my website, which is CEO, the number two, Rainmaker. Maker is abbreviated. So it's CEO number two, rainmkr.com. And Lupe, thank you again for all of your time. And May I meet you in person someday? Of course. And everyone else, peace and out. And I'll see you in about two weeks. Bye-bye now. This has been CEO to Rainmaker with Gene Valdez. To find out more, like us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you have questions, email the show. Find that link and others in the show notes. Thanks for listening and join us again next time.